You may be seated. Um, I love Jesus. I'm in a place where um, uh, Apostle and Prophet uh, Peter and, and Tricia, they're friends. Though I think they tried to uh, uh, ghost me for a while. I wasn't invited for a while. <laughs> but can I tell you this? Because there's been a little bit of time without seeing them, I'm awed at what the Spirit of God has done in them. And I'm not talking about just you sitting here. I'm not talking about the new building. <sighs> Peter, there's a freedom on you that just looks good. <sighs> you know, and I thought he was free before. But, I mean, there's a freedom on that it looks good. And, you know, you know, let's be honest. I'll go on this side so I'm not standing on the same side as Trisha. a wild woman. When it speaks of Jesus and his word and the sword, it's fast and it's quick and it's powerful and it's Trisha. <laughs> oh, I do. I just love you guys and I love what God's doing on the inside of you. And it is a joy to celebrate when you see what, what the Spirit of God is doing. But I don't believe that this is it. I, 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 um, uh, the worship, phenomenal. I, uh, you know, what can, what can you say when you uh, stay in the presence of God long enough to get a little transformed, to look a little bit more like him than you did when you came in? And that's, that's, that's the very goal of, of, of what we do. And uh, what our desire is, because we know that what holds our gaze, what holds our gaze, holds our heart. And uh, you know, we'll we will not let that go. But through worship, again and again, and I kind of spoke it out a little bit in the prophetic. But I really feel very strongly that the Lord is speaking about taking you from a place of promise to a place of uh, manifestation, and. So I want to start with just a deliverance anointing over you right now. There have been many of you that have been satisfied with a prophetic promise over your life when you have yet to see it fulfilled or fully fulfilled. Or you have heard the amazing, you know, I'm standing in a place right now. I know the amazing other ministers that have stood on this platform. You know, I mean, they're friends of mine. They're, they're, they're those of us that have journeyed together for years. They're all, they're our heroes of faith. All of those things. And I'm standing in a mighty place like that. And so I know you have been so inputted and so uh, uh, impacted. But can I say this? The Spirit of God does not want you to get comfortable with promise when the whole purpose of promise was to keep you moving forward to manifestation. <laughs> that it is not enough for someone to affirm what you carry and what your calling is, but it is that you are operating in that and you are growing in that uh, daily. It's not enough that there is a prophetic promise concerning your family or your spouse or your children, but, you know, it is the manifestation that they are standing in the purposes and the destiny of God and that God is redeeming all the time that uh, uh, that uh, rebellion had a hold on them. The manifestation of God is a joy, and sometimes you can't go on to the next promise until you've had the manifestation of the last promise. Sometimes the very thing that fuels your faith, that causes you to go from faith to faith and from glory to glory, is the fact that what he said before now uh, is not the hidden pregnancy, but it's that which you have an ability to carry. And you're able to go, God did this, he can do that. God did this, he can do that. He can do absolutely anything. There's a church that Greg and I used to go to um, every year uh, in uh, California. Um, 
and uh, their name was Black, no uh, relationship uh, uh, with my husband. Uh, his name is Greg Black, Sharon Stone. But uh, no relation there, but their name is Black. And I would go every year, and I'll tell you why I went every year. It wasn't just because they invited me. I had never been to a church before that every year when I came, all the things that I prophesied the year before had already come to pass. That didn't happen in my own life, so I was jealous. I mean, I was really jealous. And so I went because I wanted to hear all of those things, and I wanted to see all of those things. And it just kept happening year after year after year after year, and they just kept coming to pass. And so uh, I remember Greg and I just sitting down with him and said, please, can you just teach us? Can you just instruct us? Can you just tell us what you do to bring things from the place of just the prophecy or, or just the, the hope or the declaration to the place of manifestation. And they probably didn't do a whole lot different than what you did, but maybe, they're, maybe they were more consistent with it. They were certainly more consistent with it than I was. And so they wrote out every prophetic word. They divided up every prophetic word, God, your part, my, my part, our part, uh, 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 society's part, <laughs> you know, and they interceded over those things. They had prayer points. They had action points on them. They had them on the walls of the church. And when we would come back the following year, they would go, this came to pass, this came to pass, this came to pass, this came to pass, this came to pass. Father, right now, you know, an incubator keeps the warmth and the oxygen upon a new life. that it might have an environment to live in. Father, right now, we just thank you that King of Kings is an environment, Father, that the promises of God can be manifested in, that they can come forth to the fullness of life. Father, that there will not be that which stops in the middle. Father, that we will not be a people of words, of promise, of just saying God said this, but we will say God did this. Yeah. We are asking, I love the prophetic, but God, we want to move from God said this to God did this. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Uh, I want you to know, um, seeing many of you that I have known over the years, it just stirs my heart with affection and the goodness of God, and, and you're just a blessing. And uh, I want to share a few things, but I want to be brief because I, I really want to prophesy to you, not because I believe I'm, I'm the greatest prophet and you need to hear from me, but I want you to know that that. You know, everybody can prophesy, um, and I believe everybody I know that prophesies have got good motives, but I'll also let you know this. There's something different that happens when you have a lot of love, too. There, there's something different that happens that takes that word and takes it deeper. It doesn't fall on the ground that you have to pick it up and apply it, but it, it, it targets your heart, and it goes to a place where it can bring change, where it's a set word for accomplishment, and that's what we're believing. I want time for that today. I don't even know if I'll get to my message today, but I think I will. But the, um, I live in Europe, I live in England, and uh, I remember after the first few years there, I think sometimes an atmosphere will have an effect on you. And I think uh, there was a, a caution that had come to me. I've been through a lot there, and I think there was a caution that come upon me. And a cautious prophet might as, might as well go get a job and pay for somebody else to prophesy. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And um, so I remember that. But I remember seeing some different ones come through, and they would prophesy the pie in the sky, and they'd prophesy the, 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 the everybody was was going to be a billionaire, everybody was changing the world, everybody was this and everybody was that. And I would think, oh, I'm just so wise, God, I can see past all that, you know. Oh, God, you know, that, that you know, if they could just speak truth and realness, then we could get on with what uh, you've called us to do. And the Spirit of God on the inside of me said, do you believe that I could do more than you could think, dream, 
<laughs> or ask, and I said, yes. He says, do you believe that I have more for each of these than they could ever think, dream, or ask, and that, that I am speaking those things over them, and if you can't agree with them, you can't speak them. And there is something about the prophetic word going and grabbing something on the inside of you and bringing it to manifestation and bringing it to visibility and bringing it to areas of partnership that is so important. Amen. Okay, my message today is landing a move of God. I believe that the Spirit of God does not want you simply to be a good church, does not want you to simply be a good apostolic center, does not want you to simply be someone that holds the ground here, does not want you simply to be a road straight to uh, the White House and uh, to government influence uh, through the areas of intercession prayer and the prophetic. But the Spirit of God says... He is bringing a fresh awareness that you are called to build a landing strip for revival. And uh, God wants a landing for the move of God. And I don't believe that God anymore is simply talking about um, a little glory spots and, and, uh, and revival wells. I believe what God wants to do in the earth is a move. And it is that which gets stronger and gains momentum, much like uh, uh, the, the rock rolling down uh, the, the, the snow healed. It gets, gains girth. It gains speed. And when it crashes on the bottom of the valley, it changes the look of the landscape. Father, I pray that over these right now and those that may be watching it online or archives later, Father, that we declare that this is a season of a move and we've got to get beyond us being able to uh, 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 embrace or just be able to believe for what we have seen before. But God, we want to see what we've not been seen before. I just want to share this with you. I was actually, uh, my family had a prop plane when I was growing up. And my dad and my brother were pilots. I decided not to be a pilot because I realized that uh, in the car, if I got in a little accident, I dinged the fender. You know, if in the air I had a, a blip, uh, you know, uh, you know, somebody got hurt. And, uh, or, or somebody died or, or that. And I just decided, not out of fear, I just decided that wasn't my thing. Now, my brother was a great pilot and a very good pilot. My dad should not have ever been allowed in the cockpit. <laughs> I mean, it's just true. And um, I remember uh, many occasions. Um, one is when you fly small planes, you often get to land at small private airports when you fly. But if you're flying at night, they don't leave someone there to tend the airport at night. So what you do is you line up your plane and you kind of flick your lights. And if you catch the, it's automated. And so if you fl flick your lights in the right path, then you'll see lights light up that show you where the runway is so that you have an ability to land safely upon them. Before we go on, the Spirit of God says, I'm bringing an alignment to you, says God. And he says, because there is those, he says, that have been looking for that landing strip. That when you invite my kingdom to come and my will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Lord says, I am coming, says the Lord. He says, uh, 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 uh. Uh, with a strong, says the Lord. He says, movement. And I'm coming, says the Lord, with a strong invasion from heaven. And the Lord says that I am looking for you, he says, to find that place. He says, where the light even brings, he says, definition and direction for the landing of this move. Father, I pray for each one of us. Father, that that is an individual word, that is a corporate word. Father, that is a territorial word. Father, right now we ask, Father, that you would cause us to know how to apply that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, let me go on uh, there. Um, my my um, a dad, again, is not the best of pilots. And I remember one time we were flying and we were going to land at the Orange County John Wayne Airport. And my daddy came in too fast and too low. And so on the first time he, he came in to land, he had hit the landing gear. And he hadn't realized he had damaged it. And so we came around again uh, to land. And uh, there was no landing gear. And so we slid in 
on our belly with sparks flying everywhere, you know, no way to break, no way to turn, no way to do anything else. And I was young enough that I remember instead of just feeling like I was going to die, I was so embarrassed, you know, because, you know, I mean, they're, they're sending out the fire engines, you know, they, they've got the alarm going, you know, everybody is coming to look and, you know, you're going to have to climb out of this little prop plane and, and that, and, and, and thank God we did, we climbed out alive. And then I should have learned from there and, and that it was uh, not wise to fly with my dad. But, uh, you know, it, it, you sure could get far fast uh, in a flight. But I believe that the Spirit of God is saying this. The Lord says, I'm bringing forth a move that is going to come so fast and so suddenly it's going to feel like it slides in on its belly, says the Lord. And the Lord says the sparks are going to fly and it's going to be celebratory. And the Lord says there's going to be that, he says, that does get the attention of many. And some don't know whether to be excited or alarmed. Says the Lord. Amen. Let me give you another story. I could do these all day, but I won't. I remember one time he picked me up in Arizona. We were flying back to, to uh, uh, California. Not a, not a super long flight, but, but we were flying late at night. And so we were probably about halfway there. And he goes, um, oh, I think we're just about out of fuel. And he says, I don't see anywhere, uh, you know, on, on the map and on my navigation where we could go get any. And I said, what are we going to do? And he says, we're going to have to land on the freeway. And so what he does is looks for a truck stop close to the freeway. And so we come down in between electrical wires, all of that. And we land between trucks and cars on the freeway. And then we turn off to go across uh, uh, just the, the uh, empty ground to drive over to a truck stop we see in a little bit of a distance. And so meanwhile, as we're driving over there, dust is flying up at us. You know, it's as messy as could be. We picked up a couple tumbleweeds and branches that we're dragging with us, you know, as we're coming in. And then we pull up into the truck stop. And, you know, my dad climbs up on the wing. And evidently, you know, because it did work, that if you have enough fuel, you can add the, the truck fuel to it, and it'll mix enough so you can still fly, because I'm here. And um, so... <laughs> but I remember being so uncomfortable and embarrassed... You know, I mean, to pull up in the midst of that with dirt all over us and, and dragging tree branches and tumbleweeds behind us and, and my dad climbing up and putting, you know, fuel into the, into the plane and then us taking off again. Lift your hands in the Spirit of God. says, that which I am doing in this hour is uncomfortable and messy. <laughs> and the Lord says it's going to press every religious, ambitious, and transactional bone in your body. But the Spirit of God says it's going to accomplish that which is above your wildest dreams. And so the Lord says that I am preparing my people for that which I'm doing in this time. He says, so they will not look in another direction. But the Lord says, they'll know what they're looking for. And they'll be able to partner with me in a greater way. And the Lord says, so that which I'm going to do on the inside of you is not going to just be polished and pretty. Let me just say this to King of Kings for a moment. You have always carried such an amazing uh, spirit of excellence. That's part of what you do and who you are. And we all admire that about you, you know. But I think what God's getting ready to do is kind of undignified. Wow. And, you know, I realize um, it's kind of like the refreshing. We quit wearing dresses and we started wearing slacks to the, you know, 
Because if you're going to be on the floor with your feet in the air, you want to wear slacks. So I just want to tell you, ladies, it's not time to come to church to look cute. But I believe that we're going to uh, come to engage with the power of God in a fresh way. Um, this is a season of war that is on this new move landing. It looks like that maybe it should be a different season, but it's a season of war that this landing is taking the place in. It was a season of murder when Jesus was born. And if we don't understand that this is the very atmosphere that we need for this move of God to be birthed in, then we won't see it. But it is meant to come forth in this season of war. And let me just share this. I remember that moment when my dad was sliding in on the belly of the plane, you know, and I'm there there uh, with him, you know, in the midst of that. And, you know, I was a Christian. I was saved. My dad wasn't. You know, that was not a place for non-essential conversation. We didn't talk about where we were going to eat that night. We didn't talk about what we were going to watch on TV. We didn't talk about our to-do list. Shut up and pray. I believe this move of God is going to need some intercessors. And I believe that the priority upon that is going to be shut up and pray. Shut up and pray. And there is going to be something so urgent within each one of us that we realize that prayer can only do this. And it is a season, United States, I believe it's for the world, but it's a season, United States, for prayer movements again. It is a season for those things that the enemy doesn't shake the earth, that is the Spirit of God shaking the earth. He says, yet once more, I will shake. I like it when he does the shaking. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, shut up and pray. Okay. I believe one of the things that we pray for, and this is probably one of my favorite sayings right now, I believe we're praying for a stripped-back, presence-driven church. I really believe we are. I believe we're being delivered. And um, it doesn't mean we don't have nice buildings. It doesn't mean we don't, we, you know, or, or that. But this is a stripped-back, presence-driven church that we are going to spend more time making room for God than making you comfortable. And I think that that's very important that we all hear that at this time. Because if we're coming to be encountered by God, that means we're leaving to be mobilized for souls. That the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. And one of the things in Europe, because I have the privilege of facilitating um, the European Prophetic Council, one of the questions that I ask all the prophets that we work with in the different countries is, what are you doing to facilitate the harvest? Because I find you can ask a pastor that, you can ask an apostle that. You can ask an evangelist that. People don't ask prophets that. And, it is, and we don't get away without facilitating the harvest as well. One of the things that my husband and I uh, started doing a few years ago is we realized England didn't have a lot of evangelists or didn't have a lot that were well-known. Or or not only that, they didn't have a lot that were well-cared for. You know, people want their evangelistic meeting uh, annually once a year, and how do the evangelists eat the rest of the time? You know, and uh, so so what Greg and I did was... um, We rented buildings, we gave them our equipment, we used our database to get them students so they could have evangelistic schools. 
And I want you to know, word gets around. <laughs> and then we had one of the largest evangelists in Europe, and even one right now working with Ben Fitzgerald there and in, in, in Germany, that, that they're including us with the evangelists when they come together. And I want you to know, they don't know what to do with us. They don't. But if I, we don't stick around as an apostolic prophetic people, they are, never are going to know how to build together. And I believe that all parts are necessary to build. And so we're, we're definitely growing uh, in the atmosphere. So we're, we are coming together to encounter God in this move of God. But we are leaving to encounter those that maybe don't know him yet. And I don't believe that is just a, a, a calling upon the evangelist. I'm going to tell you one story because I think sometimes you forget you can do something small and it changes the world for somebody else. I remember going into this meeting. It wasn't a large meeting. Maybe... Um, maybe uh, uh, two, two, three hundred people. And I remember uh, I, the train had got me there late, and so they kind of slipped me in the back door straight to the platform. I had not met the couple that, that invited me uh, that were pastoring the church, I mean, just as they were walking me in the building because I think they had already had probably an hour and a half of worship, you know, waiting for my train to get there. But as we were coming in, I passed someone outside, a young man, he looked like he was about 17 years old, and you could see where he'd been crying, and his eyes were red and, and swollen. And, and, you know, you do exactly what anybody with compassion would do, you know, just grab hold of his arm and gave him a good squeeze and looked in his eyes and, and smiled at him, and they, and they uh, quickly moved me onto the platform. And I stood there and thought, I have no idea what to do, God. And it wasn't because I needed an atmosphere. It wasn't because I needed that. It was just, it felt something, felt different. And so I thought, well, do what you always do, Sharon, prophesy. You know, and I said, oh, could that man stand up over there? Could that couple stand up over there? Could this man stand up there? While they're standing, I get ready to prophesy and I can't. So they're standing. And so then I said, you know what? I saw a young man as I walked in tonight. I said, could somebody go out there? He looked like he was a little bit distressed. Could somebody go out and bring this young man in? And they brought this young man in, and uh, I think he was a little older than what I thought. He looked like he was 17. But I started giving a word, and then I assumed, yes, he is older. The Lord said, it is not your fault. The marriage has failed. So I figured he's older than what I think. And uh, the Lord says that it is not you that sinned, and you are not going to need to be set down in ministry. And you are still qualified. And the Spirit of the Lord says, I'm going to do great things. Meanwhile, he's already on the floor. And now he's really crying. And a pen could drop in the meeting. You know, because you have no idea what you're touching there. And so, so he's laying there, a puddle at my feet. And I go on and I prophesy to these other ones. It turns out this young man was a young evangelist. Um, they had just been in South America. His wife had left with another minister there. Um, he was totally heartbroken. His parents actually pastored the church. He was the son. And the elders and them had had meetings and realized that he needed to be set down, you know, and, and out of ministry for a while. And the people I called up were the elders of the church. See, prophets, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we don't. We, you know, and even in the best day, we only prophesy in part. And so I've got somebody, in a, a man in a puddle at my feet crying, and I begin to prophesy over these, and they're on their knees, and you have no idea what's going on. And so they come and they whisper, Oh, and part of the word to this man was the Lord says, I'll give you another wife. And I don't prophesy those things. I mean, that would just slipped out before I, you know. But because uh, I don't. But let me tell you what happened. That young man, his name is Jonathan Conrath. 
he is a mighty evangelist in the world today. I think we're cl close to um, 200,000 people saved, over 13 uh, verified resurrections from the dead. I don't even remember the last number on blind eyes healed. He's a good man that we work with. We, we find it quite privileged to work with him. And uh, he gives that testimony uh, in a lot of places he goes. But there was a woman in that meeting that became his future wife. And there was a nine-year-old boy in that meeting. And this nine-year-old boy had been on some of the uh, mission trips. He was the son of one of the elders that had just asked him to sit down. And his name was Steve Paltrow. And nine years old. And he sat there and he said, God, because, you know, ministry families know what's going on. Kids know what's going on. And he sat there as a nine-year-old kid. He says, if that's what prophets can do, I want to be a prophet. Wow. Steve Paltrow is now a multimillionaire, strong prophet, pastor in the U.K. that is a phenomenal force to be reckoned with. I slid in on my belly in that meeting. I did. That was, I mean, just straight from the train, not knowing a thing that's going on. Because it doesn't always register here, but it registers here. And I'll be honest, I believe that God will give me some of the blessing from those 200,000 people coming to know the Lord, and those, and then those people being raised from the dead. Of course, that wasn't why I did that. But I just wanted you to hear that. You have no idea what goes on in a meeting when God speaks, because he says his word cannot return to him without accomplishing what it was sent to do. And we have got, so we just let it land, and we're, we are in such need of affirmation that we let it land to be a promise and a hope rather than a manifestation. And when God's speaking about landing a move of God right now, he is not wanting just a hope. He is wanting those that are looking for the manifestation of it. And I actually believe this. You will never have your own building until. And that is not a negative. It is the fact that there is something that God has saved for you. And your last days are greater than all of those that are before you. And that there are some things that the Spirit of God is going to do. The type of building that you're going to want for this move of God is going to look a lot different than this type of building. Because it facilitates differently. And I believe the Spirit of God is ready to start giving vision, start giving direction, even in that place. Thank you for staying with me. I, we're praying for a stripped-back, present-driven church where we are going to be mobilized to see people saved. And the Spirit of God says this to you. Just lift your hands in the room. The Lord says, it's all about the preeminence of my son. He will become the greater revelation of the church. It's all about the preeminence of my son. Where there's nothing before Jesus, your king, your savior, your healer, your deliverer, the only hope for the world, your husband, Jesus has to be first and foremost. And the Lord says that I am working this on the inside of you. And the spirit of the Lord says you're going to find out those that seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, all the things that they thought they needed or the Gentiles had need of, I am going to add to you, says the Lord, and you are not going to be without, and you are not going to feel like that living a laid-down life for the sake of others is a sacrifice. But the Spirit of God says, because, he says, I am giving you the kingdom, and I am taking care because of how you've aligned yourself and how you've positioned yourself. You will find out the very fulfillment that you have longed for is in this day of alignment, is in this day, says the Lord. He says that I have brought you to. And so the Lord says there is a consecration. 
You know, we can't get away from that. And, you know, I know in the last season we heard the Lord giving words about exposure. And people were afraid the enemy was going to expose them. But listen, I'd be a whole lot more frightened of God exposing me than I would of the enemy exposing me. But even more than that, I think there's something else. I think it's time to be more concerned. Oh, whatever you do, Jesus, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your presence from me. There's a consecration. You know, I got, I got to give a scripture because I haven't given a scripture. The Lord says, who will ascend the mountain of the Lord? <laughs> but those with clean hands and, and a clean heart. You know, there's, there's no way to get to be a part of some of the great things of God that, that it doesn't uh, have a great impact upon each one of us. You know, uh, let me tell you a secret. I was in a... I was in a, a, a worship retreat last week. No, last month. And Greg and I, we're the oldest ones there. You know, because it's 72 hours of nonstop worship. And we're also the only two that have chairs. You know, everybody else, they make stand or sit on the ground or in this big tent. And so Greg and I are there, and I'm so enjoyed it. And we were worshiping and <gasps> pressing in uh, 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 to God. And, and we're thrilled. And somebody comes over on Greg's side over here, and I can kind of hear what they're saying. And he, and he presses to Greg, and he says, is that the great prophet? Get it to Greg, and Greg kind of leans back so I can answer the guy, and I go, no. <laughs> Jesus has got to have the preeminence. <sighs> there is a time, if you don't get out of the Holy Spirit's way, then you are in the way. You are in the way at that moment. Anyway, so, so Greg and I are just enjoying ourselves so much in the, in the presence of God and, and uh, pressing through. And, and uh, I do have a, a lot of focus. So, so I, I, was, I was enjoying it. I did look up a couple times and find that Greg had gone. But, um, uh, I, you know, everybody has to have toilet breaks. But, um, but it was a tremendous time. In the presence of God, and we had great uh, worship teams. Even Naomi Rain was there, and different ones. It was just a phenomenal time. And um, I don't take those things lightly when you're sitting in the midst of that. But as good as all of that is, this is what God wants to say. You can choose to be satisfied in this moment if you want to, because you're seeing an increase of salvations, you're seeing an increase of deliverance, you're seeing an increase of baptisms, you're seeing an increase of power, you're seeing an increase of worship and the, and the level of worship that God is bringing each of us into. You're seeing an increase in the Holy Spirit in, in fuller altars. You're seeing an increase in deeper accuracy of the prophetic. We're seeing all this, and as good as it is, the Lord's saying, I do not want you to be satisfied with this portion. He says, instead, he says, I want you to realize, he says, what you're receiving is not simply for yourself, but what you're receiving is necessary for the next generation. And I need you to receive, he says, like they went out. He says, that double portion. He says, they would go out and gather twice for the Sabbath. They gather Two portions. The manna. The Lord says, I want you to start gathering. He says, multiple. Spiritual provision in my presence that you can overflow and that you can feed others around about you, says the Lord. And the Lord says, don't be content with your portion. The Lord says, because I've made you different. The Lord says, when I built you, I put ingredients within you that no generation has ever known. And I'm not talking about a Z generation right now. I'm talking about if you're alive on planet Earth right now. And the Spirit of God says, I put legacy on the inside of you. That you can no longer be satisfied with building your own ministry, building your own business, building your own family. There's something, if there's something up, there's something on the inside of you that's not bigger and farther reaching and lasts past your life, you are no longer satisfied. I put that within you, says the Lord. The Lord says, when I created, he says, this generation, 
He says, I put on the inside of you the ability to be fast-tracked because in the last days, time will be speeded up for your benefit, says the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord says, there will be those of you that have resisted change before that now you're going to embrace change because of what I put within your mother's womb when I created you, says the Lord. You are going to be able to run and not be weary, says the Lord, because I made you that way. And the Lord says that you will not be satisfied simply for what I can touch your life, but you want that which is going to have a legacy, that which is going to touch your cities, and that which is going to touch your nations. And the Lord says, I have made you for that. And the Lord says, so even now, if you want to be frustrated, deny that call, says the Lord. But the Lord says, if you want to be impassioned, recognize he says, that which I have given you, says the Lord. And the Spirit of God says, it will cause, says the Lord, he says, for you to be one that won't have to do it in your own strength, but you will mount up on those wings of eagles. And the Lord says that I'll get you where you need to be doing what you need to be doing. And I believe that there's a divine landing, uh, heavens touching earth, where your promises become manifested. And I believe that's one, the main thing that the Spirit of God had, had me say to you. And it is a place of consecration. Remember, just like in the cockpit, there was no non-vital conversation. Shut up and pray. You know, I, I know that it's good when you have people here that say, oh, watch what you watch on TV, watch what you do with your time, you know, watch what you, what you do over here, what you do over here. I agree with all of those things. But you know, when I am so full of doing the things that God has given me to do, I don't have time for any of those other things. I find it a whole lot easier to live life on my passion rather than my discipline. Wow. Well. Multitudes, multitudes are in the valley of decision. I believe these are nations in the valley of decision that Joel's speaking about here. But I believe this valley of decisions is also where we begin to see sheep and, and goat nations separate. Not that there won't be those that are saved in goat nations and those that aren't saved in sheep nations. I believe that we're going to see that. But we are no longer waiting for that time to come. I believe we're in the process of that time. Even though on the great white throne we see a, a ultimate, I believe we're in the process of it right now. And so I believe what you do has an ability to impact uh, a nation at this time. And I believe that this move of God that you're going to carry, this is the move of God that's bigger than your church. This is the one that begins to change the nations. This is the one that brings in that billion soul harvest. Now, I could come to you as a prophet today and I could say, peace, peace, but I'd be lying to you because we are in a day of war. And I believe this move of God the environment that is conducive to us landing this move of God is war. We don't like that, but it's, it's still true. And I believe that the Spirit of God is doing it. I want to challenge you. This move is going to be uncomfortable. This move is going to be messy. But the Lord says, if you'll get into alignment, if you're willing to stay in position, you're going to land this move. And you're going to lead and carry this move of God. And God is not saying that you won't get to participate in it if you don't come into alignment and you don't do that. But I'll be honest, you won't get to lead it. See, the second I find out that great is available to me, good is no longer good enough. The second I find out that I can carry and lead a move of God rather than just participate in a move of God, participation is not good enough. I don't want you to take lightly these words that I've told you today because I believe you're invited to carry and lead a move of God. Can you stand to your feet? Shopa papaha, hora pa shanda rabatanda rabako, 
ro papa hande de ke se taraba shote de Jesus in this place I don't care if they're a greeter I don't care if they're a children's worker an administrator or if they're or a pastor apostle prophet evangelist teacher Father the same alignment the same consecration the same sacrifice is required of every single one of us it is not just for the few but father it is upon every one of us and so father we stand in this place and god we know this about us We know some days we like us and some days we don't like ourselves. Some days we think we did a pretty good job and other days we think, "Oh dear God, how could you put up with us?" So we come to you, which is our only help and our only hope. And say, so, "Jesus, do what you're best at." You're our redeemer and we need another level of redemption. You're our deliverer and we need another level of deliverance. You're our healer and we need another level of healing. You're the one that conforms us into your image and dear God, we're tired of not looking like you. So God, the sound of those that are going to carry this next move. You know, there's always a sound You know, I know Chuck Pierce loves to come here and he always says, "God's looking for sound. God's looking for sound." The sound of this next move is a sound of desperation. It's a sound of desperation. I can't do it without you, God. I don't want to do it without you, God. I don't want it to revolve around me. I'm ready for it to be all about you, God. I'm ready for that. Holy Spirit, there is a net you are releasing over this room I just saw. And even as you ask Peter to drop the net on the other side of the boat, he received a catch that was beyond his expectation. He had nothing that he could measure it by. Father, you are going to receive a catch from these people. God, you are going to bring forth a catch from each of these lives that is so far beyond anything that they could believe is possible God the mirror of heaven is coming down to remind each one of these what manner of man and what manner of woman you are that the spirit of god is upon you to remind you why you were put upon planet earth why you were brought forth in this generation and what an amazing plow that you get the privilege of grabbing hold of father i speak joy i speak excitement i speak anticipation and i speak expectation over your people in the name of jesus And you knew you could only give away what you got. You can say a lot of words, but you can only give away what you got. Father, I release your presence in a new place, and I release your presence without measure. I'm a counter woman. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I get, I do live in the presence of God. Father, I release upon each one of these the inability for the sameness, the inability. to not be ravenous and desperate. Father, I release over every one of these. That we will do anything to create a place for your move to land up on earth. Father right now release your sending anointing upon each one of these right now in the name of Jesus that you would feel the very power of God behind you 
that his strength propels you, that it directs you, that it guides you, that you are not just people that are aiming at a target, but you are aiming at the bullseye, that you are people whose time is redeemed and you are people who are seeing the course fulfilled that he has given for your life. Father, I thank you for that right now, that you had a people you wanted to pull together today. And Father, we honor all of these. I believe it's a word for anybody in this season, but I believe there's a special aspect of it for this house today. Can we just take a moment and just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah.